All right. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's, to today's local government education program provided by the University of Illinois Extension. My name is Lisa Merrifield, and I am a community and economic development specialist with the University of Illinois. For sound quality, we have muted microphones during the presentation. If you have any questions or problems connecting, add those questions to the chat space. I will monitor the chat space and pose comments and questions to our speakers at the end of the program. Today's webinar is called Ready to Diversify, Lessons Learned from Coal Communities Across the Country. Our presenters are Jack Morgan, Associate Director of the National Association of Development Organizations Research Foundation, and Brett Schwartz, Program Manager, National Association of Counties. Brett and Jack will cover how rural coal-reliant coal communities in, West, in the West and in the Appalachian regions are working to diversify their local economies through workforce development, retaining entrepreneurship, outdoor recreation, cultural heritage, renewable energy, and more. They spent the past five years visiting and collaborating with coal-resilient communities in the region as they work to build stronger economies by tapping onto local assets and strengths. A recording of this webinar will be available to, on our local government education website and YouTube channel. Participants will receive slides and links to those resources from today's webinar, as well as a recording when it's available. At this time, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Great. Well, well good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to join you all today. Uh, this is Jack Morgan uh, with NACO. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to join y'all, and we're excited to uh, to talk a little bit uh, today about coal communities, uh, economic resilience, and diversification, and uh, just some experiences and lessons learned from NACO and NATO's time in, in working with coal communities uh, across the country uh, as they seek to uh, react uh, to changing conditions and retool or reinvent uh, their local or regional economies and, and grow stronger economies uh, for the future ahead. Uh, we certainly recognize the, the challenge and concern that many of you all are, are facing or could face uh, in Illinois, and that's why you're uh, joining us on this webinar. So um, uh, we hope that we can just share some both uh, high-level ideas and, and tips, uh, as well as discuss some actual uh, community strategies that, that are being pursued in, in coal-impacted communities. Uh, we'll mostly be talking about uh, Appalachia and, and the West. And, and then, of course, you know, hopefully we'll have some uh, time to continue discussion uh, through Q&A. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and, and dive in. Here's our just a little bit of an introduction and, and background though uh, first. Uh, so as I said, I am Jack Morgan uh, with uh, NACO. It's the National Association of Counties. Uh, I'm a program manager for community and economic development. Uh, and in case uh, you all are unfamiliar, so uh, NACO uh, is a membership driven uh, organization. We're based in, in Washington, D.C., and we represent the 3,069 county governments across the country. That's ranging from uh, L.A. County at uh, over 10 million down to Loving, Loving County, Texas, uh, population around 130 and, and every county in between. Uh, uh, of course, if you, you might be familiar that, you know, roughly two-thirds of the counties in uh, the nation are rural in, in nature. So, uh, a, a lot of the work uh, that I do is related to, to rural economic development and, of course, related to, to coal-reliant communities, um, as we'll discuss. Uh, as you might, might imagine, as an association based in, in Washington, D.C., we do advocacy at the federal level on Capitol Hill uh, for counties with the United County Voice. Uh, but the team I work on uh, the department is called County, uh, our County Innovations Lab. Uh, so we do data research as well as um, best practices and, and technical assistance, which you know we'll be diving into a little bit uh, here today. And uh, and so that's really helping uh, counties learn from each other, uh, case studies, best practices, and, and us as staff and and other thought leaders and, and subject matter experts, connecting them with resources and ideas. Um, and, and so one of those, of course, key programs that uh, that we've been working on. Uh, is this idea of, of economic resilience. So how can counties uh, react, um, adapt, and, and ultimately ho hopefully mitigate, get ahead of uh, economic downturns, economic stresses, um, and really looking at economic diversification. And, and we've done that uh, a lot through uh, the lens of, of coal-reliant communities, um, as said. And, and so we'll dive into that a little bit more. But of course, at the, the county level, we 
you know, we recognize that that counties uh, or that economies don't uh, stop at, at county lines and that they're regional in nature. And so we've been uh, you know, blessed to have really good partnerships uh, with our neighbors in D.C., the National Association of, of Development Organizations. Um, and so I'll let Brett introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Jack, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Brett Schwartz, Associate Director at the NATO Research Foundation, uh, just a few blocks uh, from NACO. Uh, the Research Foundation is a nonprofit research uh, and training arm of the National Association of Developments, or NATO, uh, which is a membership association of regional planning and economic development organizations all across the country, uh, but primarily those that serve uh, smaller metropolitan and, and rural regions. Um, at the Research Foundation, I head up our economic uh, resilience and that uh, diversification uh, training program and it's been a wonderful partnership uh, with NACO over the past uh, few years. Um, you know I'm really looking forward to our presentation today. It's, it's been a real honor uh, to be able to kind of travel throughout the country and, and visit with folks from coal communities who are tackling some big challenges with, with a lot of creativity and strength and so, you know unfortunately the national narrative uh, around coal communities and, and rural America in general as often pretty negative and full of stereotypes. Um, so we really hope our presentation will give a different perspective and really show the uh, tremendous opportunity and prospects uh, that exist in communities uh, that are facing transition uh, with changes in the coal industry and, and other energy markets. So Jack, turn it back to you. Great, and real quick, Brett, if you could go back to that, just wanna uh, uh, give a shout out to that picture that Brett's in is from Delta County, Colorado, one of our coal impacted communities and uh, uh, I'm there in the Great Channels of Virginia uh, in Appalachia, and just to quickly note a uh, personal connection, and we'll talk about Appalachia, but I'm from Washington County, Virginia, uh, uh, at one time home of the, the second largest uh, coal company uh, in, in the country, Alpha Natural Resources. So um, th this is my passion, and that's uh, a personal connection there, and, and hopefully you all have adjusted to, to my accent uh, as well in the process of, of the introduction. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and next slide now, Brett, thank you. Um, so as we mentioned, our, our organizations have partnered for, for over four years now on, on supporting uh, coal reliant communities um, in economic diversification. Uh, Brett and I and our team have, uh, and other partners have traveled to coal reliant communities across the country. Uh, and really to frame, uh, kind of just before we dive in, this, we like this quote, it's from, uh, a retired Armstrong County, Pennsylvania commissioner, uh, former coal miner. You know, we need to be prepared for the future because uh, we just don't know what the future, uh, you know, holds for the coal industry. So really getting at, uh, you know, we, we as counties and, and the counties are really looking to this now is that we need to control our own destiny uh, that, uh, and not be uh, reliant on, uh, on the coal industry necessarily as the future uh, remains to be seen there. And so just a, it's about charting our own vision. So next slide, Brett. And that's really what uh, we've done as far as our programming for the past uh, over four years um, is really uh, being connectors, conveners, facilitators, if you will, uh, of coal reliant uh, counties and, and, and regional leaders um, of course, we can be there to mentor and connect them uh, with, with guest speakers and subject matter experts, but it's really about the peer learning aspect that we think that there is so much to be learned. There's shared challenges, but shared opportunities in that uh, between co-reliant uh, counties across the country and other rural counties that, that have been through similar uh, transitions. So we've been blessed to have great partners at uh, both the Appalachian Regional Commission um, and the Economic Development Administration, both the headquarters office and, and most recently with the EDA Denver region working uh, in the West. Um, we held a, with that project, we held a series of, uh, of these small peer exchange uh, working groups in, in four states uh, across the West. And then this, just this past May, we did a team-based uh, convening in Denver where we brought 11 uh, county or regional teams uh, together for a convening, we we asked the, those communities to form a, a team of five to seven, you know, key stakeholders, but being real broad uh, in thinking that and bringing in key partners, not just folks that are day-to-day -day economic development, but have uh, that are key, you know, spark plugs in your community and and a, almost like a retreat, if you will. So they they drilled down on uh, on they were intentional and drilled down on an action plan. Um, and, and so we'll talk about a few of the, what those communities uh, have done um, as well. Uh, next slide, please, Brett. 
so I always like to transition into to this this slide as you know we, we've convened a, a lot of these folks together for the for the opportunity because we really feel that you know these are you know with changing uh, issues in the coal industry and the reliance that that many communities had there that obviously there is great change and, and great challenges and and that is uh, daunting uh, for many communities but uh, it really can inspire creativity through you know really a sense of urgency and opportunity to come together uh, to unite and, and not bicker or argue between or blame to really unite as a community spark a fire and, and really coming up with creative and, and innovative solutions and and this mural is in downtown uh, Gillette uh, Wyoming Campbell County Wyoming uh, is the largest uh, coal producing county uh, in the country we held a uh, a peer exchange uh, workshop there, and, and and this is one. It's a great example of uh, of, of public art and placemaking in in downtown, uh, but also just the message I think really hits that uh, at at uh, what we've seen and, and the model that that we uh, um, that we go by. Um, and next slide, Brett for you? Yeah, so you know, um, this is a slide we often show at meetings and communities that are seeking to diversify and, and address their economic challenges. And it's certainly not meant to come across as blunt or uh, insensitive, um, but we think it's really important to emphasize that, you know, no one is coming uh, to save your communities. You know, you are the ones you've been waiting for, as this, this mural shows. Um, the local community and its residents uh, are the ones with, with the tools, the knowledge, expertise, and ultimately the personal stake uh, in addressing challenges on the horizon. So of course, their outside resources, consultants, and funding streams that you, you should uh, definitely tap into, uh, but ultimately the future of the region uh, is in the hands of those who live there. Um, and it may seem daunting, um, but you know you can take comfort knowing that there are many other places around the country, uh, some of which we'll talk today on the call, uh, that are facing similar challenges and, and rising to those challenges. Um, as Jack will mention in a moment, uh, this is a national issue, uh, and we hope you can find strength in some of the stories and best practices that we'll discuss in a bit. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say, you know, it's really important to, to celebrate victories uh, that are happening in your communities. And no question, uh, economic diversification, economic resilience, it's a grind, it's emotional work. Um, so really make sure to come together and, and recognize and celebrate progress uh, when it happens. Great, and so as Brett mentioned, uh, uh, coal communities uh, across the country, and it's, it's more of a national issue. You can go ahead and go to the, the next slide, uh, Brett, but there's, you know, uh, a lot that can be learned uh, from these counties, uh, as, as mentioned. Uh, I think, you know, some of that was some of the initial feedback that even at simplest that we had received uh, early on and, and, and even later on that, you know, we, uh, you know, we thought this was just something that was isolated to, to our county and didn't realize we had so many other counties across the country going through a similar challenge that, that we could tap into. So, uh, just quickly on, on the maps here, you can see the, the, the national map on the left are coal producing, uh, the coal mining counties uh, across the country. There's over 150 coal mining uh, counties across the country, uh, but uh, you can see that those are pretty regionally uh, condensed to the belt there in, uh, in Appalachia. Um, then the, the belt there where you all are in, in southern uh, Illinois, Indiana, and western Kentucky. Uh, little string there in Texas, but then the larger belt across the Intermountain uh, West. Uh, again, it's it's uh, often painted as uh, you know something that that might be you know so regional specific, but it, as I said, it is over 150 counties across the country that are going through these similar uh, challenges. And then even more uh, of a nationwide issue is when you look at uh, coal power plant counties, so counties with a coal-fired uh, power plant. There's over 130 uh, of these counties uh, across the country. Obviously, something will continue to track, and many of you, uh, we're all aware that uh, that that number is uh, is going down. But uh, you, you can really see that it's more of a national impact here. That's not just in quote unquote coal country. That uh, changing conditions uh, and in reliance of a county. Uh, or a region on um, on a coal-fired power plant uh, for tax revenue jobs uh, is more widespread uh, across the country, and, and of course you can see there uh, spread through throughout Illinois um, in, in your all's case. Uh, and, and so, just culminating that is, you know, again reiterating with with those shared challenges are are 
shared opportunities to, to partner together, learn from each other. And this is not unique to coal, right? You know, this is something economies have, have been changing uh, for decades, for over a century. You know, you think about other communities that have gone through uh, economic shifts. You think of uh, the timber in, uh, in Maine or the Pacific Northwest or textiles in the Carolinas. And it's not something that's unique to, to rural either. You think about a, a Pittsburgh or Detroit and other Rust Belt uh, communities with, with those industries and that so uh, one this is not something necessarily that's unique to, to coal or singling out uh, coal but it's also worth uh, noting then that there are uh, much more communities uh, that, that can be learned from and tapped into uh, as well just keeping that in mind that uh, learning from uh, from other uh, communities that have had economic shifts um, and kind of what they've done for for economic uh, resilience. Okay, thanks, Next Jack. slide. Yeah, so I think, you know, you know, it's pretty fair to say, as Jack just mentioned, the overall theme of our presentation is really to encourage you to explore ways to strengthen your resilience, um, both at the county and regional levels. And, you know, resilience is probably a term you've heard quite a bit recently, and, and we believe it's a really valuable framework uh, to discuss many of the challenges facing uh, communities in our current era. Um, and so we've embraced the U.S. Economic Development Administration's broad and inclusive definition of resilience, as you can see on the screen as the ability of a region or community to anticipate, withstand, and bounce back from any type of shock, disruption, or stress uh, that it may face. Um, so this, of course, can include weather-related disasters, hazards, and the impacts of a change in climate, uh, but also man-made economic shocks, uh, such as the closure of a region's large employer or military base, uh, the decline of an important industry, uh, changes in the workforce and population shifts. And we think the power of this definition is that it broadens attention away from an emergency-focused response, you know, how to deal with an immediate impact of a disruptive event, uh, to really planning and organizing in advance and, and rebuilding afterwards uh, with a coherent framework. So we uh, last year created a short animated video to kind of help spark the conversation in communities about resilience, uh, what it is and what basic approaches can be taken to improve resilience. And this video is meant to be shown during presentations like this uh, at community events, uh, embedded on websites and shared on social media. Uh, so we've affectionately dubbed it the uh, resilient duck video. Um, so I'm hoping we can uh, take a look uh, right now uh, at a quick, uh, quick video here. Resilience. It's a word we hear a lot these days, especially when discussing regional economic development. So what exactly is resilience and what kinds of strategies can help build resilient regions and communities? Let's take a closer look. The concept of resilience has its roots in the physical sciences. The ability an object possesses to return to an original position or shape after being bent or compressed. Yep kind of like that. That basic idea has now been applied to planning and economic development. In these scenarios, resilience is the ability of a region or community to anticipate, withstand, and bounce back from any type of shock or disruption. These shocks include both natural and man-made events. For example, we now experience the devastating effects of stronger storms, more intense flooding, extreme heat and cold, and other natural environmental hazards because of our changing climate. But shocks can also be caused by economic impacts. The region's largest employer or a military base may close, or we might see a decline in a key industry or sector leading to unemployment and the loss of a community's tax base. Whether facing natural or man-made shocks, we know that resilient regions and communities are well prepared to respond and recover. When we talk about resilient regions, we're talking about going beyond getting back to the status quo. Resilient communities take advantage of negative situations to create positive opportunities. Natural and economic shocks can inspire communities to build on regional assets and strengths and move to an even stronger position than before. It means they build back better. So what makes a resilient region? There is no one-size-fits-all approach, but some of the key ingredients include Resilience-infused decisions about planning, zoning, economic development, and infrastructure investments. A diversified economy. No one wants to be too reliant on one industry. Strong partnerships and communication across public and private sectors. Solid institutions and governance structures rooted in trust and transparency. An engaged and diverse set of stakeholders and residents. 
Remember, no community or region is immune from potentially experiencing a natural disaster or economic shock. However, all communities can begin to integrate resilience planning into local and regional programs and investments so that planning for resilience becomes your new normal. All right, so we had a little bit of fun uh, putting that, that video together. And uh, again, it's, uh, if you think this is something that would be useful to show at community meetings to help generate a conversation with your residents or business leaders or elected officials, uh, that video is available on our website and can be downloaded from there or uh, played and shared uh, anywhere uh, that you would like. So, you know, when thinking about resilience, it's, it's really important to think regionally, as Jack mentioned earlier, and whether it's a weather-related disaster or an economic shock or downturn, you know, we know that these impacts don't get one thought to geographical or jurisdictional boundaries, uh, making the need to prepare and respond to shocks, you know, truly a regional effort. And up on the screen, you can see just a few of the many reasons why forming regional partnerships and working at the regional level is, is so important. You know, similar risks and opportunities, uh, the interdependence of economies and infrastructure, uh, make the benefits of an all hands on deck approach, you know, really important and an ideal tactic. Um, as many of you know, in rural places uh, in particular, uh, where resources and support may be limited, a regional approach is almost required uh, to achieve a long-lasting and, and sustainable outcome. Um, so it's really critical, I feel, to emphasize that regionalism is, is not another level of government or added bureaucracy or a way to make communities all look and act the same, uh, but rather it's a way to really tap into local assets and strengths uh, and leverage those uh, across a region. And so supporting regionalism and lifting up local communities is the goal um, of the network of regional development organizations that exist across the country that our organization represents, uh, close to 500 of them. Uh, in Illinois, there are 19 regional councils of government uh, that cover your state. I would really encourage you to reach out to those councils of government uh, that serve your region if you haven't already, um, because staff there can provide a, a wide mix of services uh, related to planning, to economic development, transportation, workforce development, uh, and much more. It's back to you, Jack. Great, and, and so obviously we've, we've talked a lot about uh, resilience and, and how to be uh, moving towards being a more a resilient uh, economy and, and economic diversification uh, is, is one way uh, in doing that and then ultimately hopefully to mitigate, uh, as said, any uh, economic uh, shocks or, or downturns. So just a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, classroom type stuff as far as quick definitions of uh, of economic diversification, you know, that's referring to uh, regions with a varied mix of industries and an absence of dominance um, in any one industry in, in terms of employment or, or income. Now, you know, economic diversity uh, can vary. Um, you know, what we're talking about is a what the region's goods or services. So let's say coal production. Uh, it, it can also be uh, a how, so a region's um, talent base, you know, particularly is, is all, you, you might uh, not have uh, di diversification in a certain skill set or have over-reliance on, on kind of one uh, occupation um, or, or skill set, as I said, in the workforce, um, or a why, so a region's suppliers uh, or customers too. Uh, you may have, you know, a diverse uh, you know, diverse sectors of, of industries in your community, but perhaps they're all uh, selling uh, or reliant upon all of them, reliant upon, uh, you know, one, one buyer or for case in point, you know, think about uh, just to give you an example of, you know, the Washington DC area, uh, you know, by, by many metrics, you know, very diverse economy, but, uh, you know, oftentimes a lot of those, the private sector businesses or contractors are all uh, what they're they're all uh, supplying business uh, to the federal government. So, um, and of course, want to note for the next couple of slides to uh, these these come from uh, our good friend and, and partner uh, Eric Page is the president of Entreworks Consulting. Uh, been a key member of our project uh, team that that Brett and I have uh, have worked with and, and traveled around. And so, uh, next series of of slides will. Uh, will be uh, from, from his additions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just quickly, you know, high level stuff that, that we'll talk about before diving into to more of the um, actually on the ground. So what are some uh, things that, that places can do to, to begin to diversify their economy and be, begin to uh, react to uh, an economic shock? 
Uh, one is, 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 we'll say, is do your research. Um, so this includes um, research on yourself as, as well as a community. So giving it a real honest uh, assessment uh, uh, of, of your strengths uh, and your weaknesses, um, and really then hope to uh, identify uh, your assets and really build off your strengths uh, uh, much more so than, than looking at uh, your weaknesses. Uh, but you do want to understand any uh, you know, external opportunities uh, or, or threats that, that may affect. So, you know, getting to your, your, your common SWOT analysis, uh, you know, type stuff for, for community. But really want to uh, really look at your strengths and your assets, which we'll talk about, and that'll be a, a theme ongoing. Um, and, and include data in this. There are a lot of great uh, data opportunities to, to really uh, get a, a good snapshot uh, of your community, a baseline to uh, to see any assets or, or gaps there uh, as well. Some, some great resources, uh, not to toot our own horn, but you can check out uh, NACO's County Explorer. I would also encourage you to check out uh, EDA's uh, Stats America and, and some cluster mapping data uh, sites as well. Uh, also on the research and uh, you know, learning from other places, uh, uh, attending webinars or attending in-person peer exchanges, going to set up uh, visits and, and, and go firsthand and uh, and see from other places. But uh, as mentioned before, and 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 uh, a theme of our work is really uh, we find a lot of uh, good feedback and value from 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 counties and regions uh, learning uh, from other places. Not necessarily to uh, cookie cutter approaches, but to uh, get a good idea, uh, reaffirm an idea that you may already have. Uh, or tailor something back uh, and tweak it back to, to your community. And of course, when we're talking about, uh, you know, looking to the future uh, of an economy, of a community, we, we can't stress enough uh, planning. So planning, 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 uh, and, and really make planning an ongoing uh, process too. Uh, something that uh, you know, we've all heard your, your community has come together, your region, you've, you've created a uh, economic development plan or a comp plan, a set plan, and it sits on the shelf. And, uh, you know, we don't go by that notion of, of planning. You, even if it's not necessarily some formal or, or fancy document, that's, uh, we find value in, in really maintaining and, and, and making an ongoing process. Um, check back with it if things aren't uh you know working your goals so you want to uh, tweak things rearrange things based off changing changes add new goals uh we encourage that to make it an ongoing uh process uh so planning allows for intentionality uh as well as provides accountability uh, i mentioned our our team-based uh approach and, and our team-based forums uh we we ask that at the end of of, of those activities that each county or regional team complete an action plan or a roadmap, uh, which really builds in, you know, a series of three, maybe four uh, goals. Uh, who will be the key players or stakeholders to, uh, to help move those forward? Uh, so they're the kind of account accountability piece. Um, and of course, thinking, you know, regionally and, and building consensus, uh, as well as bringing in outside partners, new partners, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you don't necessarily want to, to have this working group and, and planning with, with just the, the economic development director or local government folks. Um, bring in uh, folks from private business. Bring in the workforce uh, development folks, obviously. Uh, think about education uh, or in, in really just any kind of champion uh, or you know, mover and shaker within your community that, that has some good ideas. Um, and, and lastly, uh, think about young people in, in your community and if they're uh, at the table. Um, oftentimes, uh, that, that's not the case. And, and this isn't me uh, trying to be a, a millennial on, on the soapbox or anything, but uh, we're talking about planning for the future of, uh, of your economy. And, and I think you find a lot of merit in uh, asking those young folks that, that will be the next generation of the workforce um, you know, what jobs do you want? Do you want to live and stay in this community? What would make our uh, community better? So I'd really encourage to engage young people if you're not already in your communities and in, in your planning meetings, just to, uh, to get that 
uh, opinion uh, from and, and thoughts uh, from them. Next slide. All right, great, thanks, Jack. So, um, so yeah, so from our travels and work and research, you know, we've really found communities are the ones that are, are lifting up, they're growing, they're attracting talent, um, as Jack mentioned, and, and they're also supporting small and local businesses. And, and the research really backs that up. Uh, so the Atlanta Federal Reserve has looked closely at what makes a community economically successful, and they made two key findings. Uh, the first one is that counties with higher local entrepreneurship rates have higher per capita incomes, higher job growth, and lower poverty rates. And they also found that small local businesses have a more positive impact than medium or larger businesses. Um, so successful communities um, that had a large number of small businesses um, rather than trying to have one mega employer. You know, and we often hear about kind of splashy stories of, of big recruitment projects and thinking about last year and, and the Amazon HQ search that received so much attention. Um, but as you can kind of see here up on the screen, the vast majority of jobs come from businesses that already exist uh, in a state. Uh, close to 87 uh, percent. So a key strategy for diversification is really to encourage entrepreneurship and helping local people uh, start their own businesses. And so if you're thinking about this type of strategy, you know, what are some things that you should do? Um, we could probably could talk about each of these uh, all day, um, but here are some of the key building blocks of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs or, or budding entrepreneurs in the community uh, may not even see themselves as entrepreneurs, um, yet they have the potential to take a skill, an interest, or a hobby and really grow it into a full business. Uh, so effective entrepreneurship strategies really encourage people to think about starting a business and then give them access to ideas about business concepts and relevant skills that they need. And this is much more than just how to write a business plan or how to do QuickBooks, uh, but really how to identify demand, um, to be creative, innovative, and opportunities to network. An important question to ask um, yourself and your communities is, is there a space in your community for people to come together to hang out, to learn more about how to start a business? You know, where would someone go to learn this information um, and build their confidence uh, in a future uh, opportunity. Um, so if you can't think of places that already exist or are being used, you know, it's really a start time to make those happen. Uh, co-working spaces, for example, are a really good model uh, for creating venues for small business owners, uh, entrepreneurs, freelancers, and others uh, to come together and, and work under the same roof, um, which saves costs on overhead and helps foster new partnerships and, and strengthening skills. Um, and co-working spaces in small towns and rural space and communities are starting to pop up all over the country. And I think they're really important um, to provide a location in, in smaller communities uh, where folks can really come together and have access to resources and support they need to, to launch, and sustain, and, and grow a business. Um, on a personal note, I'm a big fan of co-working spaces. I'm, I'm speaking to you from one today. Um, as I live uh, in California, uh, but my organization is, is based uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I'm one of the uh, millions of kind of remote teleworkers um, that exist around the country and, and have the infrastructure here to be able to, to do that. Uh, so overall, you know, remember this is an entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, an ecosystem is a network of partnerships and relationships. So really take the time to think about how to bring more people into this network and provide them with the skills and resources that they need. And I also want to encourage you um, through your diversification and resilience planning is to, to think about multiple forms of wealth that exist or are currently lacking in your region. And oftentimes, you know, we think of wealth in our regions uh, through a financial lens or a measure of success in terms of jobs and output. And of course, these are really important to consider. Um, but we think that this narrow view can kind of hinder your resilience efforts and really hide what, what true assets you may have uh, in your region. And so NATO, uh, the Aspen Institute, and six regional hub partners uh, are supporting communities with adopting a wealth work strategy uh, with support from the U.S. Um, Department of Agriculture and, and other partners. And this is an approach that seeks to do economic development differently. It's one that's demand driven, it keeps wealth in communities and helps lift up low income residents. And this model focuses on value change and, and developing the eight forms of capital or wealth, uh, which you can see up on the screen. Um, so by taking stock of what forms or capital um, your regions have can help improve planning, build partnerships and foster dialogue among stakeholders. And walking through these eight forms of capital as a community together can really be illuminating and can inspire uh, residents who recognize what potential actually exists uh, in plain sight. And one final note about this model is that it's important to recognize that a resilient community or region embodies all of these forms of wealth and doesn't lift up one at the detriment of another. So doing no harm is a real key strategy in this, in this wealth creation process, um, as well as working to ensure that underrepresented and low income members of a community uh, are participating in this process. So if you'd like to learn more about WealthWorks or, or what research is available, please reach out afterwards as uh, we'd love to share uh, this model with all of you as well. Great, and so thanks, Brett. And now we've we've kind of touched a little bit on on some of the the high level 
pieces and, and now for the fun part so let's let's actually zoom in and, and chat about what uh, some counties and, and regions uh, in coal country uh, are working on what strategies uh, they're pursuing uh, and of course uh, short answer it, it's a lot and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll frame it first I think you know a key theme that a lot of these uh, communities that, that you'll hear from are are one you know going back to the issue of, of assets so really leveraging uh, those strengths those assets that are unique uh, to uh, their community and, and building off of those uh, secondly uh, it, it's kind of taking on the the two-headed challenge of uh, acting in, in the short term while uh, planning uh, for the long term right you know if there's been a uh, a closure uh, you know we've got to act now and get some early wins uh, help uh, dislocated workers uh, find new opportunities while at the same time you know we're building an economy uh, re, you know retooling reinventing economy for the future uh, for the next generation and and so uh, I think you'll see a lot of these communities are, are doing that through the workforce lens right so you know retraining quickly those dislocated workers while you know uh, working at k-12 or or community college or other higher ed for the next generation, as well as you'll hear a lot of kind of these investments in place. Uh, so really, you know, making and investing in your community, making your, your community a great place to live, work, play, raise a family, which, you know, is good practice, uh, regardless of, of what uh, may be going on with uh, an existing industry, uh, um, but, but really can, can help, uh, you know, get some easy wins, but also, um, you know, create a great landscape for attracting people to want to move to your community, uh, uh, retain uh, talented people uh, in your community, and really paint a positive uh, narrative uh, of your community as well during, uh, as Brett alluded to, some challenging times with, with narrative um, in many of these communities. So first, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Southwest Virginia, and forgive me if I spend more a little bit more time on on this one as i mentioned this is my uh home region uh where i where i'm from so those if you're not familiar uh this is uh, as far as you can get away from from dc and in northern virginia uh while still being in virginia bordering uh tennessee kentucky west virginia and, and north carolina a little sliver of uh of virginia that uh historically had traditionally been based the economy had been based on uh coal tobacco uh, manufacturing, textiles, uh, and furniture, uh, all of those have uh, steadily been on the decline. So really, you know, going back to change and inspires creativity and brings folks to the drawing board. They, they looked at their, you know, region-wide working together. What are uh, assets that, that we have a, across the region uh, that we can really um, build off of and, and highlight as, as, as a strength? And, and so they uh, quickly identified um, that uh, their natural assets were one, you know, outdoor recreation uh, opportunity, which you'll see as, as a trend as we go through. Many of these coal communities are blessed not only with, with natural resources below the ground, but above the ground through uh, their mountains and trails and, and waterways. Um, Southwest Virginia has uh, a good amount of mileage of the Appalachian Trail, you know, one of the world's most, maybe the world's most uh, well-known uh, trail, uh, the New River, for an example, that the, uh, the some of the highest mountains uh, in Virginia. So they really recognize, uh, you know, these are assets that uh, that that can't be uh, outsourced. Um, uh, and and in addition to the natural assets, they recognize uh, huge cultural assets uh, as well. Uh, if folks, if many folks might be uh, familiar with the, the Ken Burns uh, documentary that uh, just came out on, on country music. And so that's come back to the fourfold of uh, Southwest Virginia is where some of the first, uh, the first country music uh, records were cut from, you know, the Carter family coming from uh, Southwest Virginia. And, and so really recognized that and created a uh, music trail it's called the Crooked Road, Virginia's Heritage Music Trail, which connects uh, major assets across 300 miles of uh, uh, of the uh, of the region um, to learn about and experience authentic uh, musical heritage. And so, 
uh, they really built the brands and then wanted to uh, connect downtown revitalization and entrepreneurship uh, to both the, the natural assets um, and the, the cultural assets um, as well. So on the workforce side as well, and, and moving towards uh, that, they also uh, really recognize the, the assets of their workforce and that they're, you know, particularly folks that may have been dislocated from the mining industry or, uh, or related, uh, they're, they're very technical. Um, and, and so they, they recognize that one, drone technology might be a good niche uh, for them. And they are one of the few areas across the country that had been FAA approved for drone research. Uh, so they were nimble with their community college in Wise County, Virginia, uh, had some training classes and quickly were able to train uh, folks in, in uh, testing uh, drones, but as well as also uh, getting into uh, the manufacturing uh, as well. Um, they're also moving forward in, in some technology pieces um, uh, in, uh, in cybersecurity, as well as looking at solar, uh, solar energy. Uh, and again, I mentioned entrepreneurship being an overarching theme. Uh, really would encourage you all to look up uh, the, the My Opportunity Southwest Virginia uh, on your own. It's the entrepreneurship network between uh, the counties in the region. Um, they've had small business plan competitions. Uh, pitch nights, et cetera, really a, a lot of investment into building that entrepreneurship culture. Uh, so moving on, uh, next, next slide. Uh, so we'll play a video here to so the neighbors in, in West Virginia, a state that certainly, uh, you know, ha has been uh, reliant on the coal industry, almost synonymous with the coal industry for, uh, for years. Uh, but uh, of course, West Virginia is, is also blessed with with great recreation and think of their tagline wild and wonderful and they're, they're really capitalizing on that uh, but they're also moving to some some really unique uh, uh, workforce and skills development uh, training to really attack uh, generational poverty that's existed uh, in that state so we're going to hear from uh, a group there called coalfield development that's really uh, i'll let the video speak for itself but but really uh, looking at uh, how we can do skills training while at the same time uh, uh, really getting uh, again to the investing in place and, and making uh, the community uh, a better place through housing rehab, uh, uh, et cetera. So um, I'll let uh, Brett uh, play the video for y'all. We're here in coal country. We've been experiencing severe economic crisis and we're working to transform that crisis into a historic moment of opportunity. Coalfield Development is a community-based organization uh, working to rebuild the Appalachian economy from the ground up. I think part of what's unique about our model here at Coalfield Development is we attack the unemployment problem from two different angles. We are developing new businesses to create new jobs, but we're also developing the workforce to have new skill sets to be able to succeed in those jobs. What we're doing with our partners is identifying sectors of the economy that have real potential here. We've developed the region's first solar company. We're developing sustainable agriculture businesses. So we're building off the strengths and assets that are already present. The 30 through 63 model is how we organize the work week. 33 hours of paid work, just like for any other business, but six hours of higher education and three hours of personal development. I grew up in a uh, small town here in uh, southern West Virginia. My family really relied on the coal industry, and it's what I thought I was going to go into before I uh, got hired on the coal field. The program I'm in specifically uh, is the Solid Base Wood Shop. We take old lumber that nobody else could really use and we turned it into a uh, beautiful work spot. Most of the people I graduated school with or went to school with, the majority of them kind of went down the wrong path, ended up with some very bad crowds. Thanks to uh, hope development, I was able to get away from that and uh, stay on the straight now. As a crew member at this point, uh, it's really given me hope for my future. As a country, we've got to do a better job figuring out how we support communities in their transition off of dying industries. It's not just a coal problem and it's not just an Appalachian problem, that's a national problem. 
and our model is a potential solution. Great, thanks, Brett. And, and, and I would encourage you all, I want to keep us moving, but I would encourage you all to, to check out Coldfield Development's website. And there's been, been several uh, uh, articles, and they actually won an award from the Bush Foundation uh, recently for innovation. And, and so I would encourage you all to check out what, what they've been doing uh, on, your, on your own. All right, so jumping over to, uh, to Kentucky, where there's a lot of great things underway in this state, uh, particularly in the coal fields of, of the southeast. Uh, Kentucky. And so one effort in particular that's gotten a lot of traction is SOAR, uh, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based in Pikeville. So SOAR stands for Shaping Our Appalachian Region and uh, began in 2013 uh, through a bipartisan encouragement of the state's Democratic governor and a local Republican member of Congress. Uh, so with the first major convening, which was held in a snowstorm in 2013, it attracted 1,500 people. Uh, SOAR has made tremendous progress since uh, in identifying challenges, building partnerships, and setting a strategic vision for the region uh, that are called the Regional Blueprint for 21st Century Appalachia. So SOAR is working on seven key issue areas that I'm sure um, are very relevant to, to all of you on the call today. Uh, those are broadband, workforce, small business, health, industry, tourism, and agriculture. So I really encourage you to take a look at SOAR as a model uh, for fostering partnerships and setting a strategic plan for the region. Uh, their website is www.soar-ky.org. Uh, and the reason that I mentioned their website is that it was actually built uh, by a company called BitSource uh, that launched in 2015. And BitSource is an incredible IT business based in Pikeville um, that has trained former coal miners to become coders, IT technicians, computer programmers, and 3D, 3D modelers. Um, it's really an amazing story, um, which is actually best told um, by a video uh, that Google produced last year. I know we're running a little bit low on time, so we're probably gonna skip through this video, but really encourage you to, uh, to check this out. Um, this small company that's really doing big things um, in Pikeville. I can see some of those folks on the team uh, working on the screen. Um, so, you know, this, this, or, this business, you know, focuses on coal miners and other adults in coding and tech. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the importance of building these skills early uh, with our kids in schools. Um, there was a column written by Tom Friedman uh, last spring, in um, which he states that all of our students in this country will need to master two codes to become successful citizens. Uh, these two codes are computer science and the US Constitution. Uh, so in order for our young people to become full empowered citizens in our modern society, uh, they're gonna need to have the tool to navigate both our computer and tech world, uh, but also our civic and political world. Uh, so there are a lot of programs out there that are helping to bring uh, these trainings to schools and communities. Uh, so really I encourage you to uh, explore those options uh, that may exist locally uh, in Illinois. Great, so uh, we'll be cognizant of time and move on to share some uh, highlights from the communities uh, that we've worked with in the West. We've just heard from, from several in Appalachia. Uh, Wyoming, certainly, uh, as mentioned earlier, Campbell County being the, the largest uh, co-producing county in, in the, the country is in Wyoming, as uh, uh, several other counties um, as well. Um, they, they launched a statewide uh, initiative called Endow for Economic Diversification, really recognizing uh, the, the critical importance of a diversification. Um, obviously, you think about Wyoming, you think about some of the, the natural um, assets uh, that they have there, uh, not just in Yellowstone Park, it's, it's more widespread uh, across the state. And so they're really uh, one seeking to capitalize on, uh, on those, the natural recreation assets, um, as well as they're, they're actually doing some really advanced things in uh, blockchain technology. Uh, as well as uh, recognizing the asset that they have in, um, in wind uh, and really uh, 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 seeking to, to, to grow the wind uh, energy sector, recognizing both the, the revenue uh, for county governments as well as relatable uh, workforce, relatable skill set uh, for those already in the energy um, industry. Uh, uh, also want to rec uh, recognize the efforts that they're doing uh, uh, mostly through a company called Advanced Carbon, but, but others, they're focusing a lot of efforts in the idea of uh, ad advanced uses of coal or activated uh, carbon. So if you think about the, you know, the concept of crude oil or, and then all the other value added you know, products, when you, you pull oil out of, out of the, uh, the ground, it doesn't just go straight in your, 
your car and it's used for myriad of other products. So the the concept there is, uh, is that the same can be done with Colt and that, uh, you know, it's just as valuable to, to break that down and use for uh, advanced uh, materials. Carbon fiber can be used to, you know, it's really tough, uh, you know, strength and sturdy materials and get into advanced manufacturing. So they're, uh, they're really looking at that. So taking advantage of that asset that, that they have of, of coal uh, and just diversifying the use that they, they have there instead of uh, putting it on a train and, and shipping it off to, uh, to be used in a power plant. Uh, and we'll hear a little bit about uh, what's going on in that space uh, in Utah um, as well. Yeah, great. So jumping over to, to Utah, you know, this is a state that's really embraced uh, many opportunities, uh, in particular those uh, amenities and assets that exist uh, in the rural areas to support tourism and, and outdoor recreation economy. Um, and this, of course, applies not only to Utah, but across the country. And there's a lot of exciting new research uh, from an organization, Headwaters Economics, um, that's demonstrating how counties with outdoor recreation economies can attract new residents uh, with greater wealth uh, that in turn lift up communities and improve economic and health outcomes for all residents. Um, so, of course, you know, growing a tourism economy must be done carefully uh, to ensure it doesn't just create low wage seasonal jobs and, and drive up home prices and cost of living for locals. So it's a tough needle uh, to thread, but an important conversation uh, to have in your communities. Uh, similar to, to Wyoming, uh, Utah is also heavily engaged with and pursuing development of advanced uses of coal and carbon uh, to develop advanced manufacturing and technology clusters. Uh, the Utah Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Initiative uh, through the University of Utah is leading much of these efforts in R&D. Um, it's leveraging this asset, you know, an already established advanced materials manufacturing sector that already exists in the state um, as enterprises have been able to develop carbon fiber defense and military technologies and is now expanded into to medical and recreational products uh, as well. Uh, Utah is also embracing remote and telework opportunities to create new jobs uh, for residents and rural communities to, to gain jobs with companies and businesses that are based in larger metros of Utah and beyond. Um, so Utah State University Extension is administering uh, what's called the Rural Online Initiative Pilot Program, uh, which collaborates with public and private sector partners to facilitate education for online opportunities uh, in remote employment, freelance work, and e-commerce. And this is a program that's flowed from uh, Governor Herbert's challenge to Utah businesses to build 25,000 jobs uh, throughout rural Utah uh, by the end of 2020. Uh, one other exciting uh, story happening in Utah, and you can see up on the screen, is the Utah Coal Country Strike Team, uh, which is led by the University of Utah, and it's made up of leaders in education, business, state, and local government. Uh, the strike team represents uh, Emory and Carbon Counties um, in the Alliance for the American Dream competition, uh, which was organized by Schmidt Futures. Um, and Schmidt is Eric Schmidt from Google, uh, the former executive chairman. Um, this team that you see up on the screen progressed through a national competition to get to the finals, uh, where it placed second in a competition that awarded over $1 million uh, in funding. Uh, so this team is promoting a four-pronged plan to promote tech and computer science in Utah's rural communities uh, to align with progress that are made in the state's larger cities, uh, to build better tourism infrastructure, to focus on housing and placemaking, and to look into incentives uh, to boost economic growth. Um, so through this competition, the group came together. It's really positioning uh, Emory and Carbon counties for success, and hopefully will now open even more doors uh, for diversification in the region. Great. And... Uh... Western Colorado is, is certainly another region doing some uh, some great work, and we were able to visit the region uh, last year, and primarily uh, visited uh, Delta County, uh, Colorado. Uh, just an example of what what they're working on, recognizing their assets of uh, an agricultural uh, uh, tradition and history there uh, in their county, and into really moving towards. Uh, really growing value-added agriculture as well. So thinking about, uh, they have uh, wineries uh, and, and cideries and breweries that are really being able to uh, have some value add uh, to some of the agricultural products, um, but as well as, you know, really having uh, uh, thriving farmer's markets and, and being able to, to send some of those items to larger metro markets um, as well. Uh, another asset that they have recognizing their climate uh, is to look at, at solar energy. Might not be, uh, you know, necessarily the, the best option for other communities, but it, it, it really fit, you know, for their unique community, particularly because they have a world-class uh, training center uh, in their county, Solar Energy International, uh, which, which trains uh, workers from across the world 
uh, in solar energy. There were folks from South America that were there when, when we visited. Um, uh, so they have trained some uh, folks that have been dislocated from the coal industry uh, th there in, in Delta County at Solar Energy International. Uh, both of these, the agriculture and the energy uh, innovation pieces, they want to look at through an entrepreneurship lens as well. So going back to that theme, um, they developed uh, a program and initiative called Engage, so entrepreneurship through agriculture and energy. Um, and uh, as Brett alluded to as well, they've got a growing uh, co-working uh, space uh, that, that's happening in locations across rural Western Colorado. Uh, and so that, that gets to the social capital piece that Brett mentioned, uh, as well as having a place where, where innovators can come together and, and learn from each other both you know, professionally, but also building networks and you know, on the personal side and friendships that really want to have people lay down roots in a community um, and stay. Uh, next slide. Great, thanks, Jax. We've got two more, two more uh, states to share with you on our, our tour across the country and appreciate you uh, sticking with us here. And, um, you know, hope all you agree um, on the call today that, you know, effective diversification really requires good planning. Um, and so the communities and regions that are taking the time to plan and set a vision are really the ones that will place themselves in a better position for new opportunities. And a really good example of this is the Coal Strip Economic Diversification Strategy uh, that was developed two years ago for Coal Strip Montana. Um, Puget Sound Energy and Town Energy have announced that units one and two of the uh, Coal Strip Power Plant will be shuttered by 2022. Uh, and residents, businesses, and elected officials are working together uh, to prepare for the inevitable impact. Um, so this strategy seeks to leverage Coal Strip's local assets and competitive advantages, uh, including its established industrial infrastructure, its dedicated workforce, education system, and proximity to, to trails and a lake. Uh, so following the release of this strategy, the regions received interest from companies across the country uh, that are beginning to um, look at possibilities in the Coal Strip area. Um, progress has also been made an effort to provide more broadband services, which was identified as the community's top priority uh, during public engagement sessions. Um, and uh, the Range Telephone Cooperative has recently announced that it will add additional broadband services uh, to support business, retail, and residential locations. Um, so this plan is actually part of the region's larger Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, or SEDS, uh, which is a multi-county, long-range economic uh, development plan. It's a locally based, regionally driven plan uh, to really create the space for the region to uh, identify its strengths and weaknesses and bring together a host of uh, partners uh, to plan uh, for the region. Um, and so many of the regional councils in Illinois um, are also economic development districts that carry out the SEDS. Uh, so really encourage you to, to reach out to your own local economic development district to see what they're doing on uh, in this space and, and how the SEDS process uh, might yield some positive partnerships and projects uh, similar to uh, the diversification strategy that's been uh, very successful so far uh, in southeastern Montana. Great and then lastly we wanted to add uh, a snapshot on northern Arizona. Uh, it, it, it's very critical and timely as you may have seen that uh, this week the Navajo generating station, one of the largest uh, coal-fired power plants in the country, uh, shut down uh, this week, and so that's a significant driver to uh, both the, the local governments there, but also to Navajo or Hopi and Hopi uh, tribal communities in northern Arizona. Uh, so some response uh, to, uh, to to that as there have been some uh, education pieces and then partnering with community college for, for workforce, but of course, you know, a major asset that they have there is their uh, unique landscapes and, and, and tourism. Uh, opportunities, some some real incredible uh, world class assets there from Antelope Canyon there on the left, Horseshoe Bend uh, uh, in the bottom right, Horseshoe Bend of, of the Colorado River, and and of course as mentioned there are some uh, concerns about uh, you know over reliance on on tourism and over tourism uh, to some of these delicate uh, communities uh, for sure, and and as well as uh, you know concern about uh, lower wage uh, jobs, so. You know, one thing to note that, that they've recognized is they also have uh, Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell there, very popular on the tourism end for houseboating. And so an opportunity to, to uh, train folks uh, in a need for, for boat repair and, and folks uh, in, in that space. So not just maybe your typical uh, tourism job that you're thinking of. Also in that same vein, the, the bottom center picture is, is myself. After we, uh, Brett and I did, uh, we're lucky enough to do Antelope Canyon, and you can see there the uh, the NGS uh, uh, stacks behind us, uh, and and that's Van, uh, and, and Van was our guide, 
he used to work in the coal mines in, in northern Arizona and they did some tours in the military, uh, but dedicated to, to lifelong learning and, and took classes and everything from biodiversity to Instagram uh, and really has, has really found a, uh, a niche there as a guide at, at Antelope Canyon, which, uh, which charges, uh, you know, upward 40, $50 a head for, uh, for putting folks through and they, they do a good revenue business and, and, and Van makes a good living. I will say. And so uh, there are opportunities in, in tourism uh, as well. It just obviously needs to be uh, managed uh, correctly. Great. So, you know, it's just trying to wrap up here. You know, I just want to say, you know, many places across the country, including in Illinois, you know, coal has been a game changer. It's created jobs. It's provided a solid tax base and, and really shaped the identity of, of many regions and communities. And really encourage you to think about ways to both honor this past while simultaneously looking at the future and, and what lies ahead. Um, and I think this is perhaps best symbolically represented by the uh, Kentucky Coal Museum in, in Benham, Kentucky, uh, which last year actually installed solar panels on the roof um, as a cost-saving measure. So this is really an example of old and new kind of going hand in hand. Um, we've also seen this internationally in places like Germany, uh, where an old mine in Essen has been designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and now houses a museum that tells the story of the region's industrial and cultural history. Um, also in Germany, in Dortmund, um, a steel plant there has become a nanotechnology hub and companies that built parts for mines are now building parts for wind turbines. Uh, so these are all examples of thinking about the future um, while really building on the infrastructure uh, of the past. Um, as we wind down here, you know, I came up uh, with this acronym a, a few years ago. I, all of you probably on the call involved in economic development or planning or government or just inundated with acronyms. Um, so came up with another one here to really think about some of the key actions um, to, to help diversify uh, your, your community. I uh, don't have time to dive into all of them, but I hope that these all emerge through our, our case studies uh, today around uh, to cooperate, to observe, to adapt, and leverage um, all those assets um, that exist uh, in, in your region. Great, and quickly, you know, we'll close with just, you know, recapping with the cheat sheet of final thoughts. And again, um, kudos to, to Eric Pages for, for developing all these, but going along with what we said, uh, you know, as Brett indicated at the beginning, you know, do it yourself, you know, we can provide resources, federal government, state government can provide resources, but uh, the future of your region belongs to its residents and, and they, and you all can chart your own, your own vision. Uh, we heard about regionalism and, and how it, it works. Uh, we stress think assets, not gaps. Um, and no secrets, uh, you know, as, as you're looking to, to build your team and your plans, uh, make sure you're transparent with, with the residents of, of your community. Uh, we talked to, about how you know we've got to both execute for the short term, but while planning for the long term, uh, and and so that includes you know building some early trust on some new projects, uh, getting some early wins, celebrating uh, those wins um, as well. Uh, and, and lastly, and, and maybe I'm I'm still on the Washington Nationals World Series high. We'll give a little baseball analogy. So sorry for the Cardinals or Cubs fans on the line for us, but. Uh, uh, hit hit for singles, not for home runs. When the, there's an opportunity where there's a uh, a downturn, uh, it can be tempting to uh, swing for the the fences, if you will, and try to get the 300 or 400 jobs back at once. But uh, really critical to to think about uh, getting those jobs back, uh, five jobs, ten jobs uh, at a time, and again, really celebrating uh, those jobs when you do. Oh, and if this is me, sorry, Brett, uh, okay. we'll close with just some resources as well that, that you can find us uh, more information, uh, a web portal that we developed, uh, diversifyeconomies.org. Uh, uh, and, and that has some resources from our past events as well as some other case studies. Uh, and, and we also have a, a, a biweekly uh, newsletter that we had been ongoing through our EDA Denver project which shares uh, uh, stories and doses of inspiration, as we call them, of, of what communities uh, uh, are doing. Uh, uh, that, that'll be added to the uh, Diversify Economies page uh, shortly as well, but reach out to us if you want the, the archives uh, of many of those um, newsletters as well. Great. So just to, to wrap up, um, you know, just want to finish with this, this message from Janera Solomon, who's executive director of the Kelly Strayhorn Theater in, in Pittsburgh. Um, Pittsburgh, as you all know, is no stranger uh, to having to reinvent its economy with the changes in the steel and manufacturing industry. And, you know, now it's known as a major educational health uh, healthcare and, and arts hub. 
Um, so Genera said the most important thing to invest in when resources are uncertain are people's imaginations, passion, and commitment. If you have that, you can figure out how to react and respond at any moment. And that's what we're seeing in all these communities that we've uh, discussed with you all today. As you can tell, really passionate about these issues. It's been a real honor to, to, um, to travel the country, meet with folks that every day are working to uh, improve their communities and quality of life um, for themselves and those who come after. So um, I know we're over time, but I want to thank all of you for, for letting us uh, join you this afternoon for this discussion. Our contact information uh, is up on the screen if you want to follow up uh, about any of these communities or want connections or would like to be introduced to any of the folks that you heard about on the call. Um, we'd happy to do that as well. So with that, um, we'll turn it back uh, over to, uh, to Lisa to wrap things up. All right. Thanks so much, Brett and Jack. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to take one quick question. And then if you have questions to follow up with, of course, you've got the contact information for Brett and Jack. And you're, and you're also welcome to work out, to reach out to um, the local government team in University of Illinois Extension. And, and we're happy to continue these conversations. Um, but the question we're going to take is about um, at what stage of business creation do you focus your support? Um, by the time someone goes to pitch an idea, they've already done a lot of groundwork. How do you get more people to the stage? Does it pay to start with hobbyists like farmers, markets, bake, market bakers, crafter vendors? Um, should we hold fairs? So how, how do you get started in business creation? Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a great question. I think it really comes down to, and, and the, the question gets to it as well, is, you know, there might be a lot of folks in your community that don't see themselves as entrepreneurs or, you know, mm -hmm. hear that term and think of, um, you know, some young tech millennial in, in the Silicon Valley. Um, but we know that, you know, entrepreneurs are all ages, um, all parts of the country, um, and uh, working in all sorts of areas. So it's really anyone with kind of a vision and dream and goal to do that. And so what we really encourage is, is to build this ecosystem um, around the community to reach out to folks that, again, may not see themselves as entrepreneurs, um, but have those resources to do that. And it really comes down to having a space in the community. I know I mentioned co-working spaces, but there's other um, opportunities and locations to do similar sort of work for folks to know um, where they can go to get that information, uh, to get those resources um, as well. So it's certainly important to uh, you know, meet folks where they are in the process. Um, and also, you know, it's hard to talk about sometimes, but per potentially there might not be, um, a, you know, there might be an, an opportunity to fail in some cases, and that can be a learning uh, opportunity and, and to provide support on that front. Um, there's a great example um, uh, of a kind of uh, event uh, that's held around the country, um, kind of sponsored by the Kauffman Foundation called Million Cups. And um, this is a uh, kind of program that's uh, hosted all across the country um, that gives um, budding entrepreneurs and small business owners a chance to kind of pitch their ideas to community members uh, in a real safe space. There's not funders in the audience or anyone that can uh, provide um, those sort of resources, but it's a safe space for folks to talk about um, their work and their ideas and show their pitch deck uh, to communities and to peers uh, to be able to, uh, to get, kind of get some feedback for when the time comes for them to really take it and scale it um, and have those kind of conversations with potential funders. So it's about kind of building programming, it's about building spaces and just um, letting folks know what those resources are, meeting them where they are, um, and uh, trying to uh, make entrepreneurs out of folks that may not see themselves um, as entrepreneurs. All right, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. Again, a video recording will be available on the Local Government Education website within a couple days. Um, and we we'll hope you will join us on December 12th, where we will continue this conversation looking at the economic impacts of coal um, plant and mine closures and making a case for renewable energy. Uh, right now, you should see a poll coming up on your screen, and we encourage you to give us some feedback on what you thought of this. And again, thank you so much for participating. <laughs>